Some time ago, before the time of digital broadcast television, there was a science show. A science show like none other. As part of Duck's Breath Mystery Theater production set in California during the mid-80s, there was Dr. Science. Oh, hi. I'm Dr. Science, talking to you via Infovideomation, a new microwave uplink technology that allows me to bring you information you neither requested nor desired. That's what community access is all about. And I'm delighted to be able to show you a film given to me by my good friends at the Shoe Council of America, a film that illustrates several important points about foot hygiene. Science and footwear. These researchers use state-of-the-art technology to develop a chemical basis for foot hygiene. Here, the scholl forsheim bunyanometer records pain aversion reaction time. Wow, will you look at that? That could be important. And the gals in control group A soak their feet in a giant chemical bath. They seem to be saying, thank you, science, for bringing our feet into the future. Well, there you have it. Reality is often more bizarre than we'd like to believe, especially when it comes to feet. 21 years later, Dr. Science no longer wears a lab coat, nor lives and works under the California the sun. Uh, okay, well then we'll just put somebody in Bobby's place. I think I'm an entertaining professor, and now they've got me teaching acting. We had a emergency need to teach acting, so I'm teaching acting and loving it. I don't know, I hope the students are loving it. <laughs> okay, let's just have our first read through of this thing. Go. Are we connected at the waist? So you guys Duh. are really happy together, huh? Let's kick them together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some fans may call it his alias, but his real name is Dan Coffey. He began working at William Penn University five years ago in 2004. Before that, he worked as an actor and on the radio. There's just a lot I know from having done it. I tell you, I didn't learn this stuff in college. I learned it by doing it. What we have here is a perfectly ordinary piece of white bread. Take it with you the next time you shower or bathe. Drain the tub and place the piece of bread in the tub. In three months' time, you'll end up with this. In six months' time, you'll end up with this. And if you can remain patient for a year or so and don't mind bathing with an artificial life form, you'll end up with this. Many people don't realize that every time you bathe, you lose thousands of DNA cells. These cells become trapped in the drain, and when combined with certain generic brands of hair conditioners, combined result in a primitive clone. Though undeveloped, this clone can be taught to obey certain simple commands, such as sit, roll over, and even kill. <laughs> right now, Rodney, we're only kidding. Okay, Junior, back to the tub. And now, Rodney, what's our next question? Uh, well, I mean, what I should have done, but I didn't want to do, is teach kids about science in a new and interesting way. That's not what I was trying to do at all. I was trying to do absurdist theater. I wanted to do, uh, be silly, and I wanted to be like Pee Wee's Playhouse or something, you know, absurdism. Mm -hmm. The concept for an absurd show about science titled Dr. Science evolved from the University of Iowa in Iowa City. There in 1975, Duck's Breath Mystery Theater was formed by five students including Dan Coffey. The comedy troupe moved to San Francisco, California and began production of Dr. Science for Public Television in 1985. Later, in 1987, the show was picked up by the Fox Network. I wasn't making very much money. In Duck's Breath, we managed to have, you know, sort of socialism. We uh, split the money sort of equally and uh, had a manager we split the money with. And so, even though I was writing four of the episodes, acting, starring in all of them, I made $35,000 that year. <laughs> and I was living, uh, well, they paid for the hotel room. I was living at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. In 1988, the last episode of Dr. Science aired on the Fox Network. Yes, there is a hidden dimension. Home of pens, socks. Caps of pens, lighters, they're all here. 
What the forces of evil do with these things is not the job of science to find out. We just discover the truth. The rest is up to you. When I finally got canceled, you know, we, we knew we were in trouble because we weren't doing better than Gilligan's Island reruns and the ratings. You know, they, they post the ratings the next day and everybody just goes, oh, or yay. And at first we went yay and then we went, oh. But as I was leaving Los Angeles for the last time, and I was walking through the airport, this little kid who was helping his dad load luggage onto the conveyor belt, he turned to me and said, hey, you the man, you the science man. That's right, son. <laughs> so it was the only time I was ever recognized. It wasn't like I was a Lone Ranger or anything, you know? Well, Dan Coffey or Dr. Science might not be as popular as the Lone Ranger. Dr. Science Big Book of Science Simplified earned some popularity selling over 20,000 copies. I'm reading from the Dr. Science Big Book of Science Simplified 1985 Contemporary Books. Science was Dr. Science's main concern for as long as he can remember. He was weaned on a test tube filled with condensed milk kept at a constant 64 degrees centigrade. His bassinet was a prototype for a perpetual motion machine. It would rock him back and forth for days on frictionless Dynell bearings. The best part about the book ended up being the pictures and the captions, actually. We got these pictures. We were, Duck's Breath, my comedy troupe, we were performing in Washington, D.C., and that's where the National Archives are located. And we went to the National Archives, and I said, do you have any pictures of men like male scientists or men in general doing weird things to women. Uh, I'm writing a, a fake science text. And this guy said, I'll be right back. And he went and got all these here. I'll hold it still so you can get a close up. He got all these pictures uh, of exactly what I wanted from the Paris archives of the New York Times, the Paris Bureau archives of the New York Times. And for some reason, we had these in the National Archives, and I wanted all of them. So we uh, took them and gave funny captions to them, and they really just made an amazing book. The history of Dr. Science began in 1980 as a radio sketch for public radio. It continued to broadcast for 25 years across the country, almost eight times longer than the television series. Two books were also published, the official Dr. Science Big Book of Science, and Dr. Science's Book of Shocking Domestic Revelations. You've seen part of the show, heard an excerpt from one of the books, now for a sample of the radio sketch titled, Ask Dr. Science. It's time once again to Ask Dr. Science. So let's ask Dr. Science. That's me. Remember, he knows more than you do. That's right. Christine Arasmith from Tacoma, Washington writes, Dear Dr. Science, on the old Lassie TV show, Lassie was always telling Timmy to watch out for important threats like loose rocks, rabid raccoons, and impending nuclear Armageddon. My cats can barely work up the brain power to tell me when their food bowl is empty. Why aren't they as smart as Lassie? I feel cheated. You're forgetting that Lassie cared about Timmy, but your cats don't give a hoot about what happens to you. They just want to make sure someone feeds them eventually. Who that person is, well, they could care less. So it has nothing to do with intelligence and everything to do with intention. There may be a chance your cats are hoping that someone richer or better looking than you will eventually take over the feeding function and that just ignoring you is the best way to make that happen. Thank you, Dr. Science. With Dan Coffey involved in so many forms of entertainment, I asked him what entertainment means to him. For me, when I was a kid, entertainment was everything. It was, I mean, I didn't grow up in a farm in southern Iowa or anything, but I spent a year in South Dakota when I was eight. Man, if I hadn't had TV, I don't think I'd be here today. I would have off myself because, you know, working, doing farm chores isn't so, you know, takes time, but boy, if you had your druthers, you'd, do inter you'd watch some TV. Um, so entertainment is, uh, it's just amazing. Some people make a living doing this. Not very many of us, but some people.
Is there anything else you'd like to add? There's no reason why we can't make something happen in Oskaloosa. We have enough people to make a renaissance of anything we want to do.